welcome to Themis Podcasts. Themis is a risk management firm specialising in financial crime. Our aim of these podcasts is to bring you interesting news, interviews and recordings of our exclusive events from the world of financial crime. Welcome to episode 3 of our Themis Podcasts, entitled Corruption Doesn't Have a Colour. In this episode, Themis Head of Investigations Henry Williams interviews Ajoa Eji Twum, CEO of EBII Compliance, about Africa's corruption perception problem and the positive signs she sees for the continent's future. Hello and welcome to Themis Podcasts. I'm here with Adjua Ejjetwum, who is the CEO of Emerging Business Intelligence and Innovation Compliance. They are an African-focused agency helping investors make the right decisions when it comes to doing business in Africa. In our newsletter this week, we, re- we reported on the OCCRP's investigation into Angolan elites and how they laundered money out of their country by setting up their own banks in Portugal, avoiding the KYC checks which would have realised that their money was politically exposed. Adua says that Africa gets slightly misnomered as a corrupt destination when actually the reality is much more nuanced than that. It's an interesting point when you look at Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index and they talk about many countries in Africa still being viewed as corrupt. But the reality on the ground is slightly different. So Adua, welcome to our podcast. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Henry. Great, and it's, it's, it's very kind of you to come in today and um, really lo- really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, you say that um, corruption doesn't have a colour. Um, there's been a couple of um, you know recent cases such as Isabel Dos Santos and the Angolan, um, the Angolan money laundry. Could you explain a bit more about why you think the perception in Africa doesn't match, the, the reality in Africa doesn't match the perception we sometimes hear? So thank you, Henry, that's a very good question. Um, so what I would say is that corruption has always existed in, in different forms, and it's not really determined by politics or geography. Uh, it exists in the rich, in the poor countries, Western world, uh, third countries alike. And, and those examples that you've uh, mentioned, uh, you also uh, note that there are usually more, more than one party involved, um, usually in some of these cases that you mentioned. And so, um, and... Another thing that I would say is that uh, corruption will usually um, has a lot to do with the ethics of the, cult- uh, the culture, the governance, the control frameworks, um, if it's in institutions, the tone from the top, how laws are enforced. So there are several factors that would cause corruption and not necessarily, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily related to a particular country or business whatsoever. Um, it would also um, involve, um, usually I would say that individual states, international organizations, um, and it costs it cost are, are, are borne by citizens. So, of course, uh, when you look at Africa, um, there are deep problems. But the perception that corruption is rife in Africa is not entirely true based on the reasons that I've highlighted. Having said that, like I said earlier, there are deep problems uh, still. Um, however, there is also a lot of positive uh, stuff that is going on in Africa. We have many countries that are growing fast. We have the likes of Ethiopia. We have Rwanda. We have Senegal, um, Ghana is one of them, Ivory Coast. They've all logged impressive records. And if you look at uh, 2018, six of the top performing economies in the world um, from low base were African. And um, this feat uh, was re- repeated again last year, uh, although the coronavirus this year may have stalled that now. And uh, what I would say that what needs to be done to ensure that these glimmers of hope do not fizzle out is really training and education. Educating citizens, particularly the millennials, to know and understand that ultimate, um, the ultimate one who suffers is them. Demonstrating to them with practical examples that corruption affects the proper running of governments. It distorts the correct functioning of economies and political institutions and hampers transparency. Um, also exploits the, um, uh, the human uh, person for selfish interests and, and the fact that it renders um, respect for rules obsolete. Right. And, and, and also I, I believe that it, we just have to really highlight to them that it's a real manifestation of structural problems rather than a particular um, you know, uh, country or institution. 
And when people understand that the public sector corruption does not exist in a vacuum, and, 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 and that when money that should support critical services such as healthcare and education flows out of countries due to corruption, ordinary citizens suffer most, there will be um, an expediency to the, to the current positive shift. So you're saying that it's sort of educating citizens is absolutely key to, cha- to changing the situation. How much can outsiders help, or does this have to, does it have to be an African solution to this problem? A- anybody can help, and, and and again, you know, as a business, you see an issue. If you have the solution, uh, you step in and provide the solution. Right, um, and looking um, again, going back to the Angola case, which we highlighted at the beginning of this podcast. Um, one thing I really noticed in that was that the European Union was alerted to this money laundering. The Bank of Portugal was alerted to this money laundering. And certainly if you're, if you're stealing money from a poor country, you probably don't want to spend it in that country. You want to spend it in somewhere like the south of France or Las Vegas. So how, to what extent do you think that, you know, outside parties are complicit in corruption in, um, in Africa? And does, is the financial system to blame somewhat? So the question is, what to what extent do I think that outside parties? Yeah, to what? Leading... Yeah, so the international finance system. Mm-hmm. To to an extent, there has to be there has to be an outside accomplice to aid um, to aid corruption. It can't it can't exist in a vacuum, as you've said. Um, and so I think to what extent you know we talk about um, African corruption, but to what extent do they have to rely on corrupt people outside of Africa to get away with their loot? Okay, thank you for that as well. So I would say that foreign enablers play a huge part in this. Uh, Non-African actors play a significant role in foiling corruption in Africa through foreign bribery and money laundering. Also, weak systems have been a major factor. uh, And and furthermore, in some cases, political leaders make deals with foreign businesses to promote their personal interest at the expense of the citizens they serve. Um, Could you give an example, for instance? I mean, there are several instances um, online. Uh, if you go to um, some of these um, government uh, websites, there are several cases, some in the public domain. Um, there's also, uh, there are other individuals. I mean, I did listen to an interview uh, quite recently uh, as well um, by one, somebody from the African Union also made several examples. I don't want to, I don't want to go into the details of the names and the companies because I don't think that's the issue. I'm, I'm actually trying to address the core uh, underlying issues here. So for me and from the work that I've done in the past, working in the financial sector, and also as some of the work that we're doing now and information in the public domain, investigation that have been conducted, it is clear that foreign enablers play a huge part in uh, fueling uh, corruption. It's also very clear that the weak systems um, in um, some of the countries in Africa have also played a part. Additionally, when countries that export large volumes of goods and services around the world fail to investigate and punish companies that pay bribes, then it becomes difficult to actively prevent these types of activities. Having said that, banks have stepped in this area with robust due diligence programs which is instrumental in the detection and prevention of corruption and money laundering. Right. So what would you say then is the sort of most positive steps you've seen recently, which are sort of improved, um, improved governance? That, that's a lot. <laughs> so I will, I, I will go through um, the ones that I can um, remember. So there are a few positive developments. Uh, for instance, the improvement in democracy um, plus the swift urbanization and social media. This is actually helping to put African leaders under greater scrutiny. Uh, significantly, many countries have come uh, together in 2019 to form the African Continental Free Trade Area. Though this is in, still the, in the infant stages, the creation of a single market with some 3.4 trillion in, in combined output could help create economies of scale. Right. Additionally, so African leaders are becoming savvier in how they deal with foreign investors. Uh, they are working harder on technology transfer, improving labor conditions, and increasing local content. Um, if I look at, um, you know, so a few countries, including Ethiopia, Ghana, and Rwanda, are showing signs of having learned lessons um, uh, pioneered in Asia. And also, um, leaders have ratified, uh, implemented, 
and are reporting on the African Union Convention to prevent and combat money. Uh, to, sorry, to prevent and combat corruption. Okay. So uh, the the great work that the Intergovernmental Action Group against Money Laundering in West Africa is also evident with the risk assessment completed in 2018. And also more recently, AMO report on the West African mining sector completed in 2019 is also a great sign. Um, also, in addition, um, you know, I'm, I'm from Ghana originally, and I'm very, very close in terms of what Ghana is doing. And so if I look at Ghana, uh, we've got the, um, so Ghana is currently invested, there's a lot of investigations, prosecutions, and sanction of all reported cases of corruption. Um, and this has helped um, with, um, with, you know, with, they've also set up the Financial Intelligence Center, which has helped with this. Um, there's also a step in the right direction, which has been um, taken by uh, the Bank of Ghana in conjunction with the Financial Intelligence Center regarding anti-money laundering and the combating of the um, financing of terrorism, which came into effect uh, in 2018, in July. And then lastly, I want to also um, touch on the Public Procurement Act, if I look at Ghana, and I'm just secluding Ghana because I'm a lot more closer to Ghana. Sure. But if I think the Public Procurement Act, um, that is also very instrumental as, as, as and it sets out uh, minimum standards and guidelines for ethical procurement and adopt open contracting practices, which make data clearer and easier to analyze. The only thing I would add is that um, for, the last thing that I'll add is that for, um, it would be beneficial for business leaders around the world to implement international anti-corruption and anti-money laundering standards to combat their, their financing, uh, sorry, to combat financial crime across the board. Right. So, so there's an outside problem, there's an outside solution and there's an inside solution is what you're saying. I think um, we've been talking about Africa in general throughout this and obviously Africa is a gigantic continent and there's huge variation from region to region. Um, I just wondered if you might be able to just sort of elaborate slightly on the sort of differences in terms of governance across Africa, if that's something. And I, I see you talking about the African Union. Will there be a sort of set standards of government people will have to attain before they can be, take a full part in this trading body? Yeah, so, I mean, at the moment, it appears that the pace of, like, positive developments differ from region to region. Um, however, it is hoped that the coming together of the African nations uh, to form the African uh, continental free trade area and the governance around uh, the same there will help standardize these positive developments across the continent. So, um, there are differences. Uh, different countries are different stages of, of the development. But that is the whole purpose of the uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, is to uh, the free trade area is to help standardize a lot of these uh, regulations and, and policies and, and controls and even the enforcement. So I think that um, we, we are getting there. Um, if I'm speaking as an African, they are, um, you know, we are in the, in the right direction in terms of uh, this. Um, will I be able to give you the differences? I think, again, there are so many 54 countries in Africa. So if I'm going to be um, giving the differences, then um, it will be uh, difficult to kind of go into the very detail. But there are some countries that are ahead of others um, and, and others are catching up. If I look at Rwanda, it's a great example. Um, if I pick Ghana, Ghana is doing brilliant as well. Um, there's a lot of improvements, uh, even around uh, transparency. So, but yeah, like I said earlier, the free trade area will help to standardise uh, these positive developments across the whole continent. Well, that sounds fantastic. So for investors who are looking at Africa, what do you see as the sort of main opportunities that this sort of, you know, this sort of step change presents to them? So for investors, so in, in the past, a lot of the uh, opportunities, so if I take uh, most of the countries in Africa, if I take West Africa and even East Africa, a lot of the items in the country were all imported. Uh, and most about 80% of uh, products were imported from elsewhere. But um, with the COVID-19 situation and a lot of borders being shut, uh, they have no choice than to be innovative. And what, what we've seen now, it's a lot of innovations have come out uh, just during the last eight weeks of COVID-19. Um, in Ghana alone, there's been some brilliant um, 
technology uh, innovations that have come up. And so there is now, um, it, I believe that the continent is reorienting, um, so there's a lot of reorientation happening. And there is now the need to do it in the continent and consuming the continent, whereas before, um, people within the continent will be preferring uh, made in UK or made somewhere else. Because the borders are shut, um, the locals now have no choice than to buy products that are made within the continent. So there's a lot of opportunities in the tech side. There's also trade uh, based on the free trade area that is going ahead. And I think, again, that's also another great opportunity uh, when that, um, you know, it's going to go ahead in phases. But that's also a, an, an exciting market there. Uh, we've got agriculture, uh, the commodities, finance. Uh, the main uh, way I would say that to keep your investment secure for an investor is to stay very close to your investment. Um, make no assumptions. Don't uh, manage by proxy and ensure you understand the markets and the players and stay involved. It is very, very key. And also, I, I, I believe that for the, for the governments um, across um, the continent, it's really um, the harmonization of some of these policies that uh, I believe that the free trade area will help to um, you know, standardize. It's also very, very key, which I think it will give investors a lot more confidence uh, when they know that, okay, if I go to this country and that country, the laws are going to be quite similar. And if I have any issues, I will be protected. Um, that's also very, very key. So that's, that's kind of um, my, my take on this question. Okay, because obviously when investors look at some of these countries, they are they are flagged as ultra high risk, uh, and there's there's various due diligence checks people will have to do before they can they can take part. Yeah. So in terms of the sort of maturity of the African market, is it still needs something to be developed, or are we sort of moving to a stage where it could be considered mature and these checks aren't going to be as important as they have been historically? So when it comes to due diligence, I always advise my clients. Um, whether it's Africa or not Africa, if you're going to put your money into anything, you want to make sure that uh, you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, you understand the market, the, everything about the, what you're about to do. So the culture in Africa, uh, a lot of the country, it's so key. The culture is so important. Um, certain things that an African uh, would do, which is very normal, may not be considered very normal somewhere else based on so for example tips tips is um it's very common a lot of uh, businesses are done very informally in africa so um giving someone a tip uh it's it's normal but it's not recorded it's not as transparent it may not be as transparent as in america which is equally legal yeah. so it's really understanding how things work and making sure that you yourself are comfortable because if what uh if the culture of the place it's not in line with what you want or used to and maybe for you and for your culture this could be considered um illegal then i advise investors to make sure that they exactly um are not putting themselves in a place where they would be um seen as uh, so if i give an example again the bribery and corruption um even facilitation and all of that is considered bribery as bribery so if you're going to a country whereby, um, you know, uh, giving tips and a certain percentage on a contract to them, it's like consultancy fee. However, it's not recorded. They don't, it's not, it's the transparency that makes it bribery if you, if you compare it to yeah. other places. And so you have to make sure that you're not breaking the regulations of your country. And again, as a company, you should have your own policies, procedure, and also ethics as a business so then you ensure that whatever you're doing is in line so that's kind of the advice i always give to investors i say due diligence it's very personal and also depending on your risk appetite uh, you know somebody could find it completely okay because again for them and the organization it's completely fine another person might feel that actually this is not um, in line with what we stand for but due diligence is very key whether it's africa or no africa in terms of information availability, it's much better. But the advice that I advise in investors is don't sit behind your computer screen in the UK and do a due diligence on an African uh, entity. Be on the ground. It's very, very important. Uh, spend some time there. Make sure that you've completely understood um, the 
the culture, I, I would say the culture is so key. Uh, people in the continent, a lot of the times, do business based on trust. And yeah. if they don't trust you, they will not engage in business with you. And for them to trust you, you must spend time around them. So it's very, very key um, in, in order to uh, getting the information you need. And again, if I pick Nigeria, if you're looking for negative news and you check on Google on, an, on a company or director, chances are you may not find any, even if that person has some kind of negative news. The business community in Nigeria, um, it's a very big community, but it's also very small in terms of uh, network. So everybody's very well networked and nobody wants to be seen as saying bad things about the other person, even if it's true. So it's important to be on the ground, form good relationships. And that way, if you're doing your due diligence, then you could actually have an informal chat with people and make it very informal. They have no idea you're trying to get information out to them. And, and you could sit there and have a chat and ask about other people nicely and you're likely to get more credible information than you will get from Google search. So due diligence is key, but be on the ground and, and put your ears very close to the ground. And well, for investors well i i think i think that's very very good advice and um very interesting to hear that you know these these aren't colors on a map highlighted in red because they're corruption risks these are these are real places and you can understand more about them but it just takes time and effort to do so um so adja thank you very much that's that's a really interesting take on africa which i think you are unlikely to get elsewhere and that's been a re really interesting conversation Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me on your uh, podcast. It's been, it's been really good. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to episode three of our Themis podcasts. We hope you found it interesting and informative. If you would like to find out more about Themis, get in touch with us via our website, www.crime.financial. You can also subscribe for future news and interviews.